How did you feel about these men who would fly planes in into ships? Well, with the train cars, I thought they would start raving mad because <laughs> they've got this religion, haven't they? I, I don't. But then again, some people say, what a brave thing to do. You know, I, I, I've never experienced anything like that. I mean, I mean I've known fear. You, 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 whenever you come across something, I was always fearful. But this, you have to discipline yourself. It's, it's just a strange feeling. Now, today is VJ Day in the UK. So I was really, really lucky to get the opportunity to interview Roy Doug Miller, who is actually a veteran of World War II. And a lot of you will know, I love history. I have a history degree. And I really like the Second World War in terms of a historical field. And I've made multiple videos on it. And I'm sure, and I'm thinking about some of the patrons and my loyal subscribers, a lot of you also really appreciate it. So, so this opportunity to interview someone who fought in the war, not only fought in the war, but actually saw combat against Japanese kamikazes was just such a memorable thing. And I'll remember this for the rest of my life. Now, Roy himself was, of course, like many in his generation, very, very humble, didn't see it as a real big deal. But I'm glad I got to record the conversation and I'm glad you guys will all get to hear what a nice guy he is and how interesting his story is, but told in a very, I guess, traditional English way. So before we get into the interview properly, I just want to bring up Roy's career quickly just to show you where my questions were coming from. So Roy Doug Miller, 96, from Croydon, joined the Navy in 1940 as a 15-year-old, having lied about his age. At the beginning of the war, Doug was involved in Russian convoys on board the Halcyon-class minesweeper HMS Bramble and counts himself as one of the lucky ones. He was transferred to the illustrious class aircraft carrier, the HMS Indomitable, which was able to handle 48 aircraft just before the Bramble was actually sunk in December 1942 with the tragic loss of all lives. Doug was on active duty as a ship's gunner in the Far East for three years on board the HMS Indomitable. On the 4th of May 1945, the Indomitable was hit by two kamikazes, but her armoured flight deck saved her from serious damage. In August, with the war ending, the Indomitable supported the liberation of Hong Kong and the Japanese surrender. Her aircraft flew the carrier's last combat missions of the war against the Japanese suicide boats, which were attacking British forces. Doug remembers vividly that the Japanese did not want to surrender, and the ship's crew were warned that many Japanese aircraft had not surrendered and to be alert and ready to shoot them down. During the week after VJ Day, Doug helped guard government buildings in Hong Kong before the Indomitable returned to Sydney. So one last thing, this was done through something called the Taxi Charity, and their links will be in my description, but just for a brief overview of what they do. So the Taxi Charity for Military Veterans was formed in Fulham in 1948, to work for the benefit, comfort and enjoyment of military veterans and arranges many trips every year for veterans from all conflicts, the charity offers international trips to the Netherlands, Belgium and France, UK day trips to concerts or museums, transport to attend fundraising events as well as special days out to catch up with, with friends and comrades. To fund and facilitate these outings, the charity is wholly reliant on generous donations from members of the public businesses and trusts and the amazing group of London licensed taxi drivers who offer their time and vehicles free, www.taxicharity.org. So let's get into the interview. Okay, um, so yeah, if we get started, you said you have the questions, so obviously it's, it's in the, your brief as well that I got, so you were 15 yeah. in 1940, so... Well, yes, I, yeah, I, I, yeah my, I'm a son of a police officer in London. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, at, at that time when your kids are growing up, war clouds are on the horizon and stuff like that you're I mean it's boys boys own stuff really you think oh well, well <laughs> you get these ideas um, and I thought I want to go into the services of some sort I always thought about the Navy but then I went on a little walk up Whitehall one day and I called in various offices I looked at the Army I looked at the Air Force and I finished up in the um, Whitehall and uh, I, I joined up as a boy. Yeah, my fam family life was a bit tough. My dad was a police officer. Uh, people don't know what it's like at the beginning of the war. A lot going on and lots of life, family life was changing rapidly. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't easy for kids growing up at that time, to be honest. But there you go, you're filled with, it's boys' own stuff, really. And, and had you ever been on a boat before? Well, yes, I had my relatives my, on my stepmother's side. Thessalonians in the Isles of Scilly. 
don't know if you've ever heard of the Isles of Scilly, but a beautiful group of islands off the coast of Cornwall. And uh, I used to go down there on holidays as a kid. It was the air miles that granddad used to, you know, I loved the sea. That was the, that was the, that was why I went. Oh, I, I'll always wanted to go. I thought deep down, yeah, you know, I'd like to go. And I, and I enjoyed my time at the Bay. We, we had some rough times, but I did enjoy the camaraderie and the friends you meet. And, it was it was a great time, really. So I was a bit interested when I saw the the Russian convoy uh, side. So did you ever have well, any contact uh, with the Russians? Yeah, well, I didn't have much to do with them really. I was on, in actual fact, um, I don't know whether you want to write about this. Not much to it, but I was on a depot ship at the time. Yeah. Up in Scapa Flow, and it wasn't a, wasn't a very nice experience, depot ship. And the, the Bramble used to come alongside to get supplies and things like that. And one day I was sent for by the the coxswain, and he said, I'm looking for a replacement for somebody. And uh, they asked me lots of questions, and they were intrigued by the fact that I was an ex boy sailor. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound facetious, but we knew our stuff, um, had good training, you know. Yeah. And, 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 and he, he said, Look, I'm looking for somebody to take the place of somebody. Um, how do you feel about it? And I said, oh, I'd, I'd like it very much. It's a lovely ship, you know, it's very really smart. And so I, I, I went and packed my hammer, bag and hammock and went on board. And uh, they, they gave me the job of us as a helmsman. So that, that was my job on the ship. I was on the wheel. So you, you're on the helm. And then how did you come about to switching to the Indomitable? Well, that was uh, Bramble, of course. Which, sadly, as you know, it was only a temporary measure. Yeah. So I was, I was not a full-time member. It was only a temp stop gap. And we came down to recite one day for a, a boiler clean, and they just said, said, we're going back to Portsmouth, where you original, which was my base. Yeah. But in other words, I'd sort of done my bit on the Bramble, and they sent me back to Portsmouth. Uh, funny old Navy in those days, the Bramble was a Devonport ship, she was registered in Devonport, but I was a Portsmouth rating, so I think that possibly might have had a decision. Anyway, I did my stunts, my stint on the Bramble, uh, not much to talk about, it was a bit rough. Uh, but I think the two main problems was the weather, it, it's not easy, um, we were sort of attacked a few times, but the main thing was keeping station, you know, in a convoy, the most important thing is the ship you're on remains in station. The, the merchantman used to wander all over the place. I can hear my captain now on the bridge, like a phone in his hand, trying to get his part with English, and he's trying to get his instructions across to somebody who doesn't understand them. Yeah, you can imagine him trying to encourage some foreign skipper to keep station. <laughs> yeah, it must have been a, must have been a it's nightmare. Important, it's important to have a discipline, as you can imagine. Anyway, it, it, it was okay. It was okay. I, 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 I quite, it was a good job to have. That is kind of Sort of, sort of in relation to, so you, you transition to, I imagine it's it's the Germans who are attacking you on the Bramble, and, yeah, and then well, you switch to the Indomitable. Yeah, attacking the convoy is mostly, most of the time. We didn't see a lot of action, but it was, you know, I, I, I've seen some nasty things like ships going down. That's not a very pleasant experience. Sometimes you, you go through a, a bad phase where you see ships have been sunk and, there's bodies in the water. And you know, if anybody goes into the water up in the seas around there, they're dead in within minutes. It's to kill her. But we didn't see a lot of that, but when you do see it, you, 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 yeah, it's, I don't, I don't like to think about that too much. You went on to serve in the Far East, so I, I, I was always, something I've always wondered, um, so how did you view the Japanese compared to the Germans? Because obviously the Japanese didn't directly attack uh, England, but they were attacking the colonies. So I, I don't know if there was a disconnect between fighting them compared to fighting someone that threatens well, your home yeah, side directly. Well, I, 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 we, we never had any sort of physical contact with any Japanese, like the soldiers in the Far East were having. You know, the, the, you know, the kamikazes, was our, they were our biggest problem. And, you know, they're, they're, they're just sworn to their emperor. They've got this, I forget what they call it now, some sort of banzai, they called it. It was a, a religion, really, kamikaze. Yeah. It was a harikari, wasn't it, word was. But we had briefs from our gunnery officer before we left. We went, we had long, we had, we went into the hangars and we had a film of what we'd expect. So we were quite well briefed.
briefed on yeah. what they could do. And we did, re our fire direction was good. So we were well briefed for it, and well trained and well disciplined, which you have to have to have a good air of discipline on the gun screw. And there's eight of us on the gun. One of your questions was, what is it? Was it what type of gun? It was the old pom pom. Oh, okay. I don't know if you, do you, do you remember the pom poms? Is it more like a flat, a flat cannon? And yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a, tw it's, a, tw it's, tw it's twelve barrels. Yeah. We, we used to, f it used to be known as the Chicago piano. This is just a skylark because it was named after the, you know, in America, the days of prohibition. Yeah. That these gangsters had these Tommy guns. Yeah. And they used the rate of fire. And we used to call it the Chicago piano. I <laughs> Everybody say, what the hell is the, the Chicago piano? It's a pom-pom, really. <laughs> <laughs> the rap, a rapid fire, a very good weapon, and we, we did well with it. To that point, is um, you said you were very disciplined, so I imagine you're not thinking this when you're in... Uh, action but how did you feel about these men who would fly planes in into ships well what a frank answer i thought they would start raving mad because <laughs> they've got this religion haven't they I, I don't, but then again some people say what a brave thing to do you know, I, I, i've never experienced anything like that i mean i mean i've known fear you, 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 whenever you come across something i was always fearful but this, you have to discipline yourself it's, it's just a strange feeling when you're up against it, you're going to do something. But, uh, you know, these people were just dedicated. Their, 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 their emperor was their god. You know, and to, to, to me as a young man out there, it's very difficult to understand it, frankly. I guess it's still very difficult for people to understand. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but when they're coming at you, you, you you've got to remain total discipline. It's not bravery. There's no such thing as bravery. You yeah. do the job. And I guess, like you're saying, that that's how you got to do it. If you don't do it, they're going to get you, aren't yeah. they? It's just, uh, if you ask anybody that's had a physical effort in a war up against it, it's either them or you. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's, it's a simple thing. If you didn't do your job, they do. They, they, you know. So it was a discipline, really, and we, we had that discipline. You experienced these kamikazes, so obviously, it, it, you know, with the anniversary of everything, uh, and a lot in the news is, is the atomic bomb. So, how, how did you and the crew react when you heard news well, of yeah, the atom bombs? Heard about this, they're, 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 uh, I've said this before. There wasn't joy. We didn't jump around with absolute joy to say. It, it was a quiet sense of relief amongst the ship's company. Yeah. And don't forget, there's, a th there's sometimes when that ship is fully manned. There's nearly a thousand men on a ship like the Indomitable. When you look at the aircraft crews, maintenance people, but there was just a quiet sense of relief. That's how I'd like to describe it. We didn't go overboard. No, 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 nobody. We didn't even splice the main brace, which, in, in naval terms, as you know, it was when you celebrate something and the, the, the king or somebody gives you the order to make, splice the main brace. That means you have a double pots of rum or something stupid. <laughs> we didn't do anything like that. Yeah. We didn't go potty. We just quietly got on with the job, looking after the ship and waiting for the next job, as it were. We were on our, we were on our way to Hong Kong anyway. Um, how, how, how did the people in Hong Kong greet you and, and how did they I, react? I didn't have much to do with any people in Hong Kong. We, oh, okay. we just went ashore. Uh, some of the boys whipped. And I was in the gunnery division, so that meant... Together with Royal Marines, we went ashore just to t take over centuries of different government buildings. It didn't last long. There was a, but there was there was nothing really. It was all a bit boring, and it didn't last long. We went back to the ship, and uh, you know, it was it was just a token. Really? I, I've just thought of a question quick because you said the the boredom. Um, I've recently been reading a book by Oliver Stone who fought in Vietnam. And he said most wa of war is j just boredom. Did, did, what do you think about that statement? Well, well there is. There's a lot, there's lot, lot, lots of period when you're doing nothing. But when you're on watch all the time, you know, you do your four-hour stint. It's a long time, four yeah. hours. And you've got to be awake and, uh, you know, you do your job. It all depends what state the ship is in. I don't know if you know anything about naval routines. There's three routines in a ship. There's the cruising station, where you're all cruising along, everybody just quietly doing their job. There's the defence 
stations when you're aware that there is enemy in the area, and there's action stations when you're really ready to go into action against it. If you have, if you imagine that, you need, you need, you can't stay at action stations all the time. Yeah. There's got to be a time in a ship when you have to relax, have, and you have to take on food. You've got to, you know, you've got to be able to sleep at some stage. It depends what phase we were in as to how we reacted in that right? What people forget when, you know, we see these movies and everything is like... Uh, there's a lot of human life that has to go on between, you know, the action and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You have to keep yourself clean, you know? and you have to you have to be fed. Yeah. It's 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 a discipline. It's a discipline. So, what was it like? Uh, and what what year did you finally uh, get home? Well, we're just just after the after the surrender, I came home on HMS Devonshire, which was a cruiser. Yeah. Uh, I came back to England in that. Because I had a career in front of me, I had to get on, you know. So what what was it like when you first, you know, the first couple of days back? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, it was a bit strange, really. It was a strange feeling getting back. We came back into Devonport. Yeah. And um, we went up to my base. I was based at, uh, my home base was at Portsmouth Gunnery School. That's where I always went when I left the ship. I went back to my gunnery school. And there was always something going on. And then that's where I was based for several months. And as you know from the record, I, 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 I went through the ranks. and I did instruction work and stuff like that. So set sense of relief, I guess, to get back to normal in some ways. Well, yes, yes, yes. We didn't overreact. None of us were just quietly pleased that it was all over, really. It's, it seems like such an old-fashioned... Um, English way to think about it. Well, that's how we were built up, weren't we? we yeah. Were that we weren't heroes. We just did our job. And and, and sp- speaking of that, because you're obviously very very humble. How how do you feel today with how your generation are revered? You know, in terms of the whole of English history, we'd say like your generation and the men and women who served during the war are like the finest generation. How how, how do you feel about that sentiment? I don't talk to many people these days at my age. Yeah. Who are in the forces, but I'm always treated with the greatest respect. I'm a very, I'm a very um, enthusiastic member of the Burma Star Association, and I have been for many years. And I make great deal of um, pleasure out of that, meeting people. And that's you know that's that's how I spent my remaining years, to be honest. And the Legion, of course, and um, some nice experiences. Pleasure of going and meeting Theresa May one day. And, Oh wow! Day and, yeah, uh, you know, that was lovely. And she took me all over Downing Street and showed me around. That was a, that was a wonderful day. We enjoyed <laughs> that very much. We were just shown everything in Downing Street. It was a fantastic time. <laughs> and whatever your politics are, she she was very kind to me. So I was just writing something about the medication um, British soldiers had to take. Um... Oh yes, yes, yes. Now I, yeah, but well, that was interesting. I did have some malaria problems at one stage in my life out there. Yeah. Most of, most of us have t- had that, you know, because I don't know, but if you know places like, think of the Lee in Sri Lanka, places like that, you go up in these creeks and there, because the mosquitoes are a bit of that. There is a bit of, there was a bit of malaria about, and some of it became, what's the worst, something, there's another disease that comes on from malaria. Uh, it's it's a well no it's a nasty one. I did I did have a, a, a touch of it, and that manifested itself later on in life because when I left the navy, I had a couple of nasty little turns. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. It's been really great getting to speak to you because uh, I've never spoken to to a veteran before. But just to to round this all off. So, um, you know, I, I kind of touched on it, but, like, if you could say, like, you know, what, what your service and what your generation service meant, how, how do you think younger people who will be growing up without as many people like you around to tell these stories, how do you think they should they should feel about, about your service and is there any, like, message to take away from it? It's a subject I haven't given a great deal of thought to. I can, I can say this. I joined as a boy. I became a man. And I enjoyed my service life. I, the discipline, you have to take the discipline. It, 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 it's, it's a way of life. I enjoyed it. I won't say I was over-enthusiastic about some of the things we had to do. But the one thing you have in a ship like the Indomitable, one of the most important things you have is you have to keep yourself clean because you know you get nasty 
it's like little diseases run around the ship because people don't keep themselves clean. I can tell you, I can tell you a little story about Sydney. Yeah, no, I, I, if you're happy to, can I, go ahead. Can I tell it to you? Yeah, I yeah. Never, I, never, I never tire of telling this story. Yeah, go for it. When we, when we first went to Sydney, as the ship approached Sydney Harbour, I don't know if you know your geography, but there's two great cliffs as the entrance of Sydney Harbour. You yeah. go through a big entrance. Yeah. And we were we were on parade on the flight deck, all my boys in my division, my guns crew, we were all formed up in our best whites because the ship is entering harbour. Uh, you know when a great ship enters a harbour, she has to be dressed overall, we call it. Yeah. You're all in your number ones and you're all paraded and the officers are standing there bringing you to attention and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So you come in with a certain amount of aplomb. I can use the word like that. Yeah. And as you come through the heads of Sydney, there are two cliffs, one on either side of you. And as you go through, as you look into, the thing opens up just like an envelope. Yeah. It's like going in. And all of a sudden, in front of you, is the harbour. The harbour's all opened up to you. Yeah. And all these little boats come out to meet you. <laughs> little local boats boats coming out to meet you and say, I bid you welcome to Sydney. It was a moving experience and I'll never forget it. It was lovely. You were defending the Australians, weren't you, as well? Yeah, oh, they, they, and they were so welcoming. We, we, we um, tied up at Woolloomooloo, which is the hub down by where the Opera House is now. It wasn't there, of course, when I went there. And we, then we tied up and I remember the first night I went ashore. Well, it was lovely. The first thing I did was walk up on under Sydney Bridge, and you know you don't get that sort of thing as 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 an eighteen, nineteen-year-old boy. Here I am, all those miles away from home, in in a lovely city like that, and and the beer was good. (laughs) (laughs) And and the women were probably very grateful to see the sailors. And their hospitality was out of this world. (laughs) They made us very welcome. That, well, that, that's a lovely uh, story to end this all on. So, yeah, like, 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 like I said, uh, thanks so much for talking with me. I, I super, super appreciate you taking the time. And, and yeah, I'll let your daughter know what, what, what we do with everything. Yes, if you would, I'd be very, very interested to see how that. So I hope you guys enjoyed that fascinating interview with a World War II veteran. If you actually have anything to say to him, that's nice. Please put it in the comments and I'll really compile them and maybe I'll send them to him. As usual, please subscribe to the channel. Check out my social media at The Cavernacle. Check out my Patreon in the description. And if you made it through all of that, thank you for watching.